Good morning. Here we are. Here I am. Thank you, Gina. It is great to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever the time is in the zone you're in. I know we are all around the world and I'm really, really honored and privileged to be here today with you all and talk about a subject that's near and dear to my heart, which is uh, student learning and giving students the best possible chance to um, level up and accelerate their learning. So what I wanna to do today is bring to you a little food for thought, particularly when we start to think about equity and infusing equity into project-based learning. Um, I've got a couple of slides that I'm gonna share with you. So let me share my screen and we will start the show. There we go. So I talk about it in relationship to um, kind of the work that I've been doing through culturally responsive teaching in the brain. Um, this book I wrote was, you know, very much um, uh, in affinity with project-based learning, even though I don't mention it as um, the driving force. There is a lot of compatibility and overlap because we are talking about how do we help students expand their capacity and their confidence as learners. And so being able to kind of leverage that is what I have been doing for the past 20 plus years. Um, but I want to tell a little story first. I began my um, awareness of um, project-based learning in kind of the late 1990s, probably around 1999, 2000s, at Castlemont High School in Oakland, California. And it was interesting because I remember coming into a meeting and it was a meeting of all of the school improvement providers and instructional coaches that were there to support the school that is in a largely um, African-American and Latinx uh, community in East Oakland. And I remember coming into that meeting and listening to someone talk about this thing called project-based learning. And I kept saying, yes, that's the brain science. And I just became more intrigued and there clearly was affinity and it was called the Buck Institute at that time. And I'm like, what is this Buck Institute? And someone explained to me. And ever since then, which has been a long time now, I've kind of kept my eye on that work and kept my um, connections with some of those folks. So it was always um, pleasing to me to see that there was a sharper focus on equity and that the Buck Institute began to uh, uh, transition. And as it transitioned to PBL works, really lifting up the statement in a way that really makes it um, clear that equity is at the center. Our vision is that all students, no matter where they live or what their background, will have access to high quality project-based learning so they deepen their learning and achieve success in college, career, and life. That is what we all want. And so being able to think about that through equity lenses becomes really important. So here's a, a, a really cute graphic that I came across as I was doing a little more research and preparation for this um, gathering this morning from the, the uh, uh, organization. And I love this idea of really keeping an eye on the students who are furthest away from opportunity, because I think the goal in equity is to get those students closer to opportunity, to give them access. And the two lenses we see here, one is to interrupt, but also to support. And that is very much in line with a quote that I focus on a lot when I am introducing culturally responsive teaching to uh, educators and teachers. And, and this quote comes from John Dewey. To prepare a student for the future life means to give him command of himself. It means to train him so that he will have the full and ready use of all his capacities. That's really what we want. We want to be able to do that. And we understand, though, that there are reasons why that hasn't happened. And I think this is a really important part of understanding 
why we have the disparities that we have, why some students are further away from our opportunity. And we know just by events it recently that these things have come to the surface. So the, the lenses we carry have to be around not only being anti-racist, but also building a bicultural lens. It's not an either or, it's a both and. So the question is, how do we do that through project-based learning? The evolution has been to start to include equity lens and, and now how do we sharpen that lens? And that's what I wanna talk about as we're moving through this and give you, you know, some, some ideas of how to get started with uh, continuing that evolution uh, of focusing on equity. So we have to attend to both things. And I think on the, the anti-racist social political context side, we are continually looking at how do we recognize structural racialization or structural racism? How are we becoming literate about kind of the ways that this plays out in society and impacts students? And we're thinking about what are the counter narratives we have to lift up in order to negate the negative narratives about what certain kids can and can't do, particularly when it comes to something like project-based learning, because there is a whole school of thought that certain kids aren't ready. And part of what we have to be able to do is to lift up how that actually is part of the inequity by design. But we also know that that's not enough. We also have to be thinking about what are the culturally grounded ways that we build trust and connection? How do we leverage the brain schema, the funds that come in? What are the collectivist learning principles that we employ and integrate into project-based learning? Because collectivism or culture for a lot of black and brown children doesn't stop and start with group work. And it is a matter of um, uh, importance to build our capacity to have a deeper understanding of that collectivist uh, set of collectivist learning practices. And here's what we do know, just colorblindness, like all kids will, you know, uh, uh, grow their brains if they engage in project-based learning. That is a type of color blindness that we have to um, be aware of and really avoid. Uh, I love this graphic as we start to talk about project-based learning, um, the, the idea that um, project-based learning is more than just kind of the dessert doing a project that is kind of the one-off thing that's fun and exciting, but we move on to regular instruction. Instead, the orientation is around uh, project-based learning as the main course, the integration uh, and the process of moving through the uh, unit is project-oriented. It is contextualized, it is real world, and it's grounded there for students. And I just took the liberty to kind of hijack the graphic because I love the metaphor to actually think about equity in the same way. There are ways in which we can do equity light, right? We sprinkle a little, little social justice or anti-racist talk in there, and then we move on to uh, having it appear to be very neutral. Instead, we need to be thinking about how is equity at the core? How are we maintaining that um, uh, lens and, and sharpening it so that we are continually helping the student who is furthest away from opportunity get closer? So one of the ways that I help people think about this is really thinking about the distinctions between multicultural education, social justice education, and culturally responsive education. So what's really important about multicultural education is that really focuses on celebrating diversity. And this is where we can fall into the trap of equity light. We just do the kind of the kumbaya thing and everybody is included. And we mention a little bit of everybody's culture and background, and then we really are all coming together. That focuses on social harmony. And what's important to lift up is this element 
is an important aspect of the kind of learning environments we want, but it is not enough to accelerate learning. So students that are furthest away from opportunity need acceleration in their learning. So social justice education, does it offer us that opportunity? Well, we want students to be reflective about kind of what's going on around them. We want them to build that capacity. So part of what we need to be able to do is help students really start to think about that critical consciousness. But here's the thing I want to point out. These first two things, multicultural education and social justice education, don't focus on learning. It is culturally responsive education that really has that focus on accelerating learning so that students have independent agency. And this is more than just choice. This is really that I have the cognitive capacity to take in information and learn at the highest levels. So I use culturally responsive teaching as the vehicle for promoting that equity. And I think it's very you know, resonant with project-based learning because here's what we know. We know that the way inequity was hardwired into our schools and our school system, our public schools, private, charter, wherever you are, is that the schools have methodically and historically underdeveloped the cognitive information processing skills of diverse students and consequently undermine their confidence as learners. So it becomes really an important piece for us to not lose sight of. It's not just making kids feel good about themselves or seeing their identity reflected in the curriculum. It's understanding that we need to make sure that the most powerful learning gets to the neediest students. And I think that is really an important piece that is at the heart of project-based learning. But here's the thing I want us to, to keep an eye on. If we want to get students closer to opportunity, then we have to think about the learning gaps. Learning gaps turn into opportunity gaps, which then show up as achievement gaps. So while we're talking about opportunity gaps, we cannot reduce them if we cannot help the learner learn at a higher level. So as we sharpen our equity lens as project-based teachers, uh, there are three things I really want to highlight that I think are really important that start to up in inequity by design that's focused on underdeveloping students' cognitive capacity. And that first one is get students ready for rigor. This is essential. It's essential because choice or integrated projects alone don't get students ready to carry more of the cognitive load. We have to actually deliberately plan for ways in which students' cognition is going to be expanded. For example, one of those learning gaps often shows up as students reading below grade level. This learning gap is not going to magically close because they engage in project-based learning. We have to be deliberate about creating the opportunities for those types of gaps that are going to build student capacity to actually do more robust project-based learning. It's not an either or. This isn't, oh, we need to stop and do small, discrete, you know, drill and kill. No, we need to think about how we leverage project-based learning to close these really, really critical gaps. Here's another thing I think is really important. We have to offer students counter narratives about their capacity as learners alongside engaging projects. Because we have to be explicit with students. Just because they have engaged in a project doesn't mean that these narratives that are in the dominant culture are not forces that are shaping their understanding or their belief about who they are. I love this idea of the learning pit. This comes from James Nottingham's work and I've really adapted it as a, a way to talk about um, a culturally responsive practice or information processing that grows student capacity. And this idea of 
academic mindset and counter narratives becomes a critical component, not as an add on, but because it is another really important piece of the puzzle. So think of it this way, learning is going on and we all know at some point learning gets hard. And how the student is able to self-regulate emotionally is really going to be dependent on what they believe about themselves as a learner. I don't understand, this is getting hard. We all say that to ourselves. But what we don't want our students to fall into, I can't do this, or what we know older students say is, this is stupid. Uh, I wanna quit is what they're saying. What's really critical is we need to get them into the pit. That is where productive struggle happens, where grappling, taking things apart, taking the inquiry stance, kind of that is at the heart of what project-based learning is. And we know what Vygotsky said is, that's a zone of proximal development. The more students can engage in that, the more their brains are going to grow. So being able to get them into the pit where they are calm and ready to take on this productive struggle is really important. Now, their ability to process information is how they get up out of that pit. So it becomes equally important that we teach them the skills of information processing. We help them sharpen those as a way to move their work forward. So I've got two more that I want to talk about, and let's talk about this next one. Offer de active demandingness alongside high expectations. You know, it's not enough just to say we have high expectations, right? We could be standing on the side yelling at the student, I've got high expectations. Uh, so what? Is that helping me do anything better? Well, the counter to high expectations, it's not even the counter, the partner to high expectations is what we know to be called active demandingness. It's the other component that a warm demander has. And the way I like to talk about it is, we have to become the personal trainer of students' cognitive development, right? Think about a personal trainer. Personal trainer doesn't jump down there and do your push-ups for you, right? They coach you so that you actually can start to take on a new mindset about health and wellness, that you have new skills to actually challenge your, your body and your muscles so that they get more efficient and more effective and they grow. This is an important part of being able to have that uh, uh, high expectation, the high expectation coupled with that active demandingness, that, that coach stance, that you're going to ask the student to level up. And that means coaching them around the learning how to learn processes, being explicit, having space for you all to talk about that, giving them timely, corrective, actionable feedback becomes really, really important. And this has to be embedded in a meta-strategic conversation about learning moves. And that word comes from Ron Rickhart. He's the author of Make, Making Thinking Visible out of Harvard's Project Zero. And I love this term so much because this is not just metacognitive, this is metastrategic. It's almost like chess. At a certain point, you wanna just pause and say, huh, okay, let's analyze that task. You've learned six new strategies. What do you think is the right strategy to tackle that task? What two would you combine? This is the strategic conversation you wanna be able to have with students. So just doing the project is not enough. Where will you make time and space to step back and say, huh, oh, how did our first pancake go, right? Because this is the idea of iteration. Things will go wrong. How do you get the student to be reflective? Not just of what went wrong, but their ability to change their learning modes. Really, really important part of the equity equation. And the last, I want to talk about is really being able to leverage diverse students' funds of knowledge. And this is where we need to know a little bit about kind of the science of learning. Because equity-focused project-based learning understands and uses the science of learning and schema theory, right? And here's the reality. Schema theory isn't a theory. It's what we know about how we hold information in our head. It's where background knowledge comes in. And background knowledge is just another word for schema, right? This is the knowledge tree we all have in our head. And the way we hook that knowledge together, we string it together, 
becomes important. Why? Because culture is a software to the brain's hardware and culture lives in the schema. So when we talk about students having funds of knowledge is they come in knowing things. And this becomes important because as you know, the science of learning, what you know is all new learning must be coupled with old learning. So if you don't know what their current schema is, the current funds of knowledge, how will you help them integrate that? So you have to understand where the cognitive hooks are, right? So being able to chunk information is not so much taking it apart and making little bits. That's a inequity move. It is actually understanding the funds of knowledge and being able to create cognitive hooks. The term chunk actually comes from brain science, cognitive neuroscience, and it is how we organize information in our head and how we hold on to it. This is true wherever I go. I go to Alaska a lot and I see place-based learning that is project-based as well, but it also leverages the funds of knowledge that the students bring in and it builds on those pieces of knowledge. The piece I think is where we have room to grow is in helping students chew on that content. Information processing. How do we help students really begin the process of chewing on the content? Meaning they have to take the old knowledge they have, their current funds of knowledge, background knowledge, and that new knowledge has to be mixed together. We know this again from the science of learning. I love the analogy of Cold Stone ice creamery or you know, wherever you go get your, your, your ice cream, that most places have some uh, a thing where they'll mix in candy or cookie crumbs or whatever your pleasure is with your ice cream. And they do that because they don't just sprinkle it on the top, but they take it to a cold stone or an area where for a minute or two, they're actually going to mix it up. In cognitive neuroscience, this is what we think about as chewing. Where are students getting the opportunity to chew but to integrate that with their current funds of knowledge. Project-based learning and project-based teaching is ripe for this. It is like designed and made for this. But if we don't have our eye on that equity lens, we're not actually understanding the funds of knowledge that students come in. We're not using uh, uh, culture in the right way and we're just summing that up in a kind of equity light kind of way, then it's not going to be effective because here's what we know. Processing that does not proceed to the elaboration stage, that's that mixing together stage, fails to make the connections that build understanding. So you can have students go through the motions of a um, uh, project and still not come out on the other side being able to do deeper learning. Um, they might have fun, but we actually have to make sure, being the personal trainers of their cognitive development, that they are actually growing their brain power as they do it. So I wanna pause there. Um, there's so much to say about this. Uh, I do want to continue the conversation. So I'm just going to you know, invite you to stay connected and to um, you know, let me, uh, uh, know kind of what you're doing in the area of connecting equity and uh, project-based learning. And I know we have time for some questions and uh, definitely want to take those. So I'm going to invite Gina back in. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. There we are. And let's see if we've got, because I see that chat box lighting up now, you know, I know enough not to look in it, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm really uh, excited to hear how people are processing and connections they're making. Yeah, thank you so much for all of that, Zaretta. Um, we do have uh, many, many questions. We won't be able to get to all of them, but I wanted to lift up a few uh, with you right now. So the, the first question I would like to um, pose to you is, um, and this seems to be top of mind for a lot of educators right now, is what practical advice do you have for supporting and scaffolding student cognition in the context of this um, emergency remote learning that we are likely to be doing um, for an extended period of time? Um, teachers have limited access to students. What, what practical advice do you have? Yeah, I actually did a couple of webinars on this very topic. And um, 
really helping th people think about how do they move beyond the, the uh, packet, right? And this is, this remote learning situation is really revealing, have we prepared our students to be cognitively independent learners? So my advice is that is the thing you actually have to help them do. So being able to help them have projects that will last a couple of weeks at home, but you know, you have to do a hide the vegetable kind of thing, right? You have to embed these capacity building uh, um, efforts, right? These gap closing, learning gap closing efforts in there. So one thing I suggest to folks is, um, word study, right? Building word world, helping kids really start to think about word consciousness, word play, not in a sense of a list, but literally helping them start to understand better how words work so they can move more of those in there. We know that the students become better readers and writers when they are able to do that. The other thing is continue to help students build background knowledge. And this means helping them not only read, but read nonfiction or watch, uh, uh, listen to podcasts, or uh, watch uh, videos about something and being able to ask them to share that information out. This is so in line with what project-based learning is. But if you have, if you see that, oh, I don't have access to my students and you think you need to have access to your students, then you have not adequately prepared them to be independent learners. You should be the personal trainer. Again, the personal trainer doesn't need to be there. They don't need to get on the floor and do the push-ups. You need to prepare the students so when the student is not with you, they are continuing to learn because that's the only way acceleration happens so that those learning gaps close. So I think being able to, to help students build word wealth, um, continue to build background knowledge and, and do that linking, the, those cognitive hooks becomes really, really an important piece. Great, thank you. Um, another question that uh, came up, uh, teachers are wondering about um, a little bit of specificity around what the alliance looks like between students and how to be able to give wise feedback as a warm demander. Could you uh, shed a little bit more light on that? I, I think, it, it, you know, that's a, that's a deep one because it is not a quick answer. And it means that you, number one, have set time and space so that you are able to have these conversations. It's one thing to do the in the moment kind of thing, but you also should be setting up time for conferencing. I was a writing teacher when I was in the classroom and it was so important for me to be able to have these meta strategic conversations with my students. So I needed time. So one of the, the core things I tell anybody who wants to build that alliance is you need to rethink time. That becomes an equity issue. How are you organizing so you can confer with students so that by the end of the month you've wrote rotate it through all your students. Secondly, how are you having meta strategic conversations with them? Are you giving them timely feedback? What are the formative assessments look like? There's a way in which we keep thinking the alliance is, I just need to be your friend or be in relationship or tell you I'm down with you. But you know what? Competence is a trust builder. When students see that you're helping them get better, they will actually trust you more. So set up the systems so that you can help them see that they are growing and that you are helping to support that. That's the core of Alliance. Wonderful. Um, related, um, people are wondering, how do we effectively engage parents as co-trainers? Well, I think that parents aren't co-trainers. They are the first teachers. So, you, you know, as the, as the kids say, you better recognize um, they may not know the word pedagogy, but if you've taught a human to be potty trained, you know pedagogy. And so the fact is we have to give respect to parents and not act like we need to help them be co-trainers. They are first teachers, always have been, always will be. So give respect, first off. Secondly, how do you actually, again, the more you understand the funds of knowledge that are coming out of a community, coming out of a home, rather than assuming there's nothing, then you can actually start to leverage parents. And again, make it gamified. Parents love to play games, right? Make it intergenerational. So one thing that I talk about on the webinar I did is this idea of uh, taboo or word study, right? Have kids do research on 
on, on words that have transitioned through the generations, right? The kids say sweet and used to be tight. And back in my day, it was groovy. Yes, um, that far in, back in the day um, where that was really the word. You know, my, my dad uses a hip cat. And I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? And it generates such interesting conversation. So the things that we need to do is to understand parents know things just because they don't know them in kind of education jargon doesn't mean that they can't be powerful partners. So think about just the way we want learning partnerships with our students, we need to have dual capacity partnerships with our parents, not learning partnerships. Do not teach your parents nothing. They should be teaching you and we should put ourselves in the mode of hearing from the first teachers. Yeah. Um. I have a blend of two questions here. Um, educators were asking about um, how, what are some examples of projects that would address counter narratives? Um, and then also related, how do we honor um, students' concerns around the Black Lives Matter movement that's happening right now? So let's take the first part of that. Um, so here's the thing about counter narratives. Counter narratives happen in multiple ways. So you can make it a project, but Sometimes when you make it a project, it feels impersonal. So counter narratives are also about bringing the narratives back that have been taken out. For example, a lot of people are just now learning of the Tulsa massacre, right? So the idea is, wow, there are ways in which the narrative has been uh, people of African descent in this country have always just been poor and downtrodden. Well, that story was the Black Wall Street. So, oh, wow, that's a different narrative. Folks were self-sufficient, they have a thriving business, there's community. So the narratives of who black and brown people are in the dominant culture have to be countered. So what does that mean for who you are? So being able to actually think about, you know, the black lives matter, I love to say black brains matter. And if you understand inequity by design, the founding fathers that actually created inequitable practices, because here's the reality, we are a country born of apartheid. They used the science of learning to ensure that certain children coming from certain racial and linguistic groups would be undereducated. That's just our hard truth. And the remnants of that are still deeply embedded. Those racial narratives of difference that's why we see the police behaving in a particular way. So the racial literary, literacy becomes really important. This is not just performance allyship. I need to say this to my black and brown kids and let them know I'm down with them. The counter narrative comes in small, offhanded, unexpected ways where the student knows this is not a performance. You're not making an announcement. It's like, I see you. A really good book, I think, uh, around just how to say things in a way that students can hear them is choice words. It doesn't specifically talk about Black Lives Matter, but it does talk about how in kind of everyday ways can we lift students up so that they can start to rewrite their narratives internally. And I usually use a couple of strategies, letters to my future self, have students write those letters so they start to change the narratives, have students actually track their narratives, right? What is that little inner critic telling me about what I can and can't do? Write those out. How do I counterbalance? What will I say to myself? So there's work that I usually lead teachers through that is about how do you do that over a six to eight week period where it looks like, again, hide the vegetables. Sometimes we want things to be too on display. And kids, particularly the older they get, they look at you with a little side eye like, mm, I don't really believe you <laughs> because if that has not been their experience, right? You have to kind of put it in there, right? Hide the vegetables. My kids didn't always want to eat the broccoli. So I, you know, put it in the chicken and rice and then like, oh, this is so yummy. Yeah. You want more of that? I'm happy. You're happy. Hide those vegetables, right? But the idea is students will know when they hear those, those words, they, they integrate those narratives and, and let that be kind of the dojo of the classroom where project-based learning come, comes in. Doesn't mean you have to turn everything into a project, it just means how you show up is important. Um, 
I'd like to take it back to the um, section where you were showing us the chart around multicultural education, social justice, and culturally responsive. Um, could you give a few examples to um, further illustrate the difference between social justice education and CRT? What would that look like in the classroom for teachers who are new to this? Yeah, I think social justice, uh, um, when we think of it in, in kind of the current form is, you would see topics. This is where the topics in the curriculum would be changed to integrate some aspects of the student's lived experience. Maybe it's place-based and it comes from the community, or maybe they're talking about protests and Black Lives Matter, but your students are still reading two grade levels behind. When you start to move into the realm of culturally responsive education, what you then reorient yourself is that your social justice mission is to help those students actually close that reading gap so they become proficient and advanced readers and writers. So now you have to get into the technical aspects of teaching those students those things. I never may mention the word social justice. I may never change the curriculum, but my social justice process and goal is embedded in leveraging students cultural uh, uh, funds of knowledge as a scaffold to help them accelerate. So that's the, to me, where the, those two things come in. And again, none of these are either or, but I can tell you multicultural education will never get you to close reading gaps. Just talking about Black Lives Matter, even though we want to talk about Black Lives Matter, then that's not going to close those reading gaps. Because if you're serious about Black Lives Matter, then Black lives, Black brains need to read. Because if you don't, you cannot live up to the promise that students will go on to college and career and life ready. That is how inequity by design, when in the birth of our nation, through segregation and enslavement of African people ensured we had anti-literacy laws. This is not new. Where are we reclaiming it? And that's just one example. We can say the same thing with math. We can say the same thing with writing, being able to be a proficient expository writer. But the fact is students need to be able to have all of these intellectual capacities at their fingertips, at their ready, so that they can map their life. They have a real agency, not just, oh, didn't we do a project last week? That was fun. Um, speaking of, we did a project last week and it was fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> you spoke um, earlier in the talk about collectivist work isn't just, doesn't begin and end with group work. Could you, um, as teachers are you know, it, at this conference and they are building projects out to go back and implement with students, what does collective, collectivist work look like beyond You know work? what, that, honestly, Gina, I'm not even gonna attempt to do that because here's one of the things that I found, particularly with white educators. There is not the effort made to actually learn about collectivist culture and to experience it. So what ends up happening is we listen to a podcast, we say, it's like, oh, someone said it was that. So I don't want to venture into that. I told, you know, let folks know how they can stay in touch because this is what we have to do collectively. And if you're a white educator, you have to get out of your own zone. You have to actually experience that. You actually have to start to understand. That's the bicultural lens. So what I try to do is help educators say, how do I actually, I'm not abandoning my own culture my own learning principles that come with that, right? The, the culture tree that I talk about, but I'm expanding my aperture to include, most people of color are already bi and tricultural. We're moving back and forth across these. Most white educators do not do that. They don't learn it. They don't spend their leisure time on it. This is what people are protesting about when we talk about the awareness around white supremacy culture. And it's not just, oh, we have to do anti-racist work. It's you actually have to understand the rules, the hidden rules of interaction that go with a collectivist way of thinking. What are the deep values? Because the actions are the deep values personified, right? If you don't understand the collectivist culture. So I don't wanna give a quick, here's a, a checklist 
And then people are going to go and say, oh, well, Zaretta said it's this, <laughs> right? You have to commit to doing your work. And that's really what it means to be an, uh, a, a culturally responsive educator, an anti-racist educator is that you commit to doing the work, not just around your racial literacy, but building that bicultural lens. Thank you. And you've set us up perfectly for the last question. We wanted to create space for any um, resources or next steps that you would hope educators take um, now that they have they've gotten to hear your wisdom and what might be a good next step? What are some resources that uh, would be good for them to explore? I, um, but here's the thing, here's my hesitancy. This is not, and I wanna go back to what I just said. Where do you start, but recognize it's a long journey. Yes. And I would really recommend not going alone, <laughs> squat up with some folks. Um, but I would say you have to be able to, you know, start with culturally responsive teaching in the brain. Um, I think in addition to that, think about, well, what is it around brain science I need to know, right? How do I actually help students kind of level up their learning? Um, I think the more we can read about building background knowledge uh, it is really an important piece. Um, yeah. I. I don't want to say here, you know, check out my webinars where I break this down, right? Because I'm aware we don't have a lot of time here. And again, it is a more complicated thing than, oh, just go read that book. And here's the thing I want to tell you, a book study is not going to lead you to equity. Correct. Right? Information is not experience. Because you've read it doesn't mean you can do it. So there's a way in which you have to continue to be in your own dojo to close the knowing doing gap. Well, I hope that people do continue to seek you out and, uh, and learn more about how to do this work um, and not just know about it, but be about it. So um, Zaretta Hammond, thank you so much for giving us the gift of your time and wisdom. Um, I hope we continue to learn with and from you and um, just thank you for all you've done uh, to help change practice for, for teachers and the lived experience of students. Absolutely. Thank you for having me and continue to have a wonderful, uh, conference. And again, I look forward to being more connected to the project-based uh, world. <laughs>